Uh, the Difficulty of Being Good uh, is a book that was written in the early 2000s by a very profound leader yeah, of corporate you. India called Gurcharan Das, who uh, sort of did a wonderful job of running Procter & Gamble. And uh, the only difference, and for this, my sincerest apology, Mr. Das intended it, and it was, actually about Hindu dharma and how you come to terms with living your life in the best manner possible. So you could say the Indian Montaigne, but uh, I'm not going to be anywhere close to that. And uh, I don't have any judgments on the dharma of investing. But I think the common thread here is that we're going to speak about behavior. And to my mind, what defines, you know, a, 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 the journey of a lifetime in trying to achieve, I wouldn't say success, but enjoyment in learning the craft of investing is being in control of how you behave. And I'm often asked, that between technique, and Mahalakshmi spoke about the years I've spent not always successfully trying to improve my investment technique, uh, which the CFA, incidentally, the, all the people who have a CFA charter, <coughs> they have a head start there. I think the CFA program is an absolutely wonderful program in terms of educating you about investment technique. And in fact, what, what really appealed to me as part of that charter was the bit on ethics. I think they have a, I don't know what you call it, a module or a, a section where, where you, when you write your CFA exams, you have to come to terms with understanding the ethics of investing, which I think is very, very important. And uh, dare I say it, very misunderstood by professional investment managers. I think the idea, and I'll, I won't spend time here, it's one of my pet hobby horses, so I won't waste anyone's time getting into it, but the concept of fiduciary responsibility as a institutional investment manager is perhaps the single most important thing that you need to get into your consciousness when you start managing public money. And very few people seem to have it. It's, it's betrayed by phrases like, I took a bet. You know, we're making a call. You're not in the telecom operator's business. You don't have to. You're not at the casino. People have reposed their faith in you, their lifetime savings, hard-earned money after tax. You need to behave with the responsibility that they expect from you and justify that faith that they've had. Okay, let me get to the idea since it's meant to be a conference on value investing. My two bits on <coughs> value investing apart from behavior. And here I'm going to sort of take the liberty of cheating. I'm going to use what someone else said, but I think it's so appropriate. And I'm going to ask you to identify who's the guy I'm cheating from. Because all of you love that guy. He said all investing is value investing. Who's the guy? Sorry? Wonderful. So this, this proves what I said earlier, that this is a highly knowledgeable audience. Everyone got this right. Okay. And why is all investing value investing? What did Manja mean when he said that? Any guesses? They are joined at the hip. Value and growth. I joined at the hip because very often growth creates value. If you have a company, and I was lucky to own one such personally, that can grow at, let's say, 15, 20% plus for 25 years, I mean, you're assured of good outcomes. You can't go wrong, no matter what happens along the way. So this company I'm talking about is Infosys, which I, or I, the first company I bought in my life, which is Asian Paints. And I was stupid enough to sell it. So you can imagine what a bozo I am and the fact that I don't deserve to be here. You know, but people overlook these mistakes. So, that, so much for that. But 
it's all the investing is value investing because when you put out one rupee today what you're aiming to do is to ensure that the value of that one rupee after inflation and taxes over the period of time that it remains invested is greater than that. Actually, investing is not about beating an index. This is another popular misconception. Sadly, institutional investment managers chase their own tail. And in the process of chasing their own tail, they very often get stuck into making some pretty elementary mistakes. And it takes a long time to figure this out. And I'll talk about indexes later, but so to me, value investing is about identifying businesses that are sustainable, that generate cash flow, that are run by people who have their mindset and their agenda aligned to the interests of minority investors and where you are able to realize that value over long periods of time by virtue of the fact that management makes it pretty clear that the business has this earning capability. So sometimes it means a spin-off, sometimes it means, you know, an acquisition to fill out a business, whatever that may be. But that simply enhances value. What I'm going to talk about today is more about, you know, how do you begin to understand who you are as an individual, how that affects your behavior, and therefore the relevant consequences for investing. That's really what this is about. Okay. So, <clears throat> One of the things, and Mahalakshmi is going to really have a good laugh, and I suspect some of the questions are going to come there, that all of us crave as human beings, and you can deny it as hard as you want, is that we love certainty. Because the idea of knowing, of being certain, is that you're in control. Human beings hate not being in control. In psychology, there's a concept called the illusion of control. Human beings hate that. The idea that they're not in control. And this goes back 3,000 years. So our ancestors, they managed to survive for so long. As Darwin said, this is, you know, the origin of species. They survived because they did some things better. Because they were more aware of the dangers that existed to their survival and they coped with it better. So, in the old days, when you were in the savanna, you were standing nearby and you heard a rustling in the bushes. What did you do? You heard that sound, right? The rustling of the bushes. You didn't bother to think. You ran for your life. Irrational response because the tiger will run faster than you you'll be toast pretty damn soon. So I don't want to get into the rationality of the response. But it's called the fight and flight response. It's become famous. It's a guy called Yuval Noah Hariri spoke at length about this. The fight, but the fight and flight response, sadly, is no longer the right response. Why? Because we're 3,000 years ahead of time, the world has changed. And today, you don't have to worry about standing next to a bush that rustles. The threats to your survival are considerably different. But that response persists in human beings. The minute they sense danger, they act. The other great thing about human beings, and I'm, I'm one of those, I, I learned this a really, really hard way. We are pattern-seeking individuals. We see patterns where none exist. Absolutely no patterns. But we love. Hey boss, you ring up the broker. Kal bajar upar kyo gaya yaar? Sir, wo tel ka dam kam ho gaya na? US economy thoda usse sudar jayega. Aur ye tel ka dam kam honne se humara current account bhi sudar jayega sir. 
तो शायद उससे फायदा हो अपने को इट्स कंप्लीट आई मीन देर आई यूज सम इम्पोलाइट टर्म बुल शेट द फैक्ट इज नो वन एज अ क्लू बट मोस्ट ऑफ अस वॉन्ट टू पुटेन दैट वी नो वट द फ्यूचर इज अबाउट दैट वी कैन हैव वट इज कॉल्ड इन साइकोलॉजी कॉग्निटिव क्लोजर so that we feel we know why the market went up yesterday that is because of randomness if you look at the pattern of daily returns over 106 years and i will i will acquaint you with that for the united states stock market you will discover pretty damn soon that it does not follow any pattern except a random pattern but or someone says they have reduced taxes on individuals no so they haven't done that sorry they have reduced taxes on corporates my fault i wish they reduced it on individuals uh because i'm suffering right now from that but uh, they reduced it on corporates so <clears throat> sir we do discounted cash flow models so you put it into the discounted cash flow model it's magical right because when 35 comes to 25 और आपने कम कर दिया वो दस टका बढ़ गया तो आपका पीएटी साढ़े तीन टका बढ़ गया यूर वेलवेट आई मीन द थिंग टू रियलाइज इज गार्बेज इन गार्बेज आउट द डिस्काउंटेड कैश फ्लो मॉडल कैन गिव यू द रिजल्ट दैट यू वांट यू मेक अ सेट ऑफ नाइस एजम्पन यू गेट अट ऑफ नाइस आउटपुट वॉट इज फार मोर इंपॉर्टेंट इज नॉट द प्रिसन what a model tells you it's about the ability to understand broadly in what direction you're headed this word modeling really gets to me a because i'm senile so when you know when i was young we didn't have this modeling business but i'm going to say something which should hopefully because all of you worship that guy make you realize the futility of forecasting and modeling why is forecasting futile why do experts make predictions that are complete rubbish because no one knows the future you got to accept that there are many things that you don't know and will never know it's not for lack of effort it's just that they are unknowable and chasing those is of no use but why is modeling a lot of hogwash especially the ones with 40 pages on an excel spreadsheet where each one is linked 39 is linked to 38 is linked to 1 why is that complete bullshit rubbish can anyone tell me what does the world's greatest investor do all of you love him right he's still very much the man to look forward to to look up to warren buffett he probably doesn't know how to switch on his laptop but in his head when he looks at a business he identifies the one or two key variables that drive the success of that business and therefore what it's worth can you imagine manja sitting in front of a huge computer and flipping between page 1 to page 3 to page 22 on a laptop creating a model any of you can visualize that thought because if you can i just love to share that visualization set clarman you know i i am a there i say i'm a reasonably good friend of his because he invested in a fund that i ran and uh, i came to know him quite well so at one stage he was very embarrassed he said you know sanjoy sorry i have something i'd like to share with you but uh, my secretary hasn't come today I was wondering, what's the problem? The secretary hasn't come. Can't share it with me. He said, ah, "We have to. It's on the PC." <laughs> so his secretary puts on his PC. He's not obsessed with the modeling part. That's the level. The world's great, and I, I'd venture to say, Seth Klarman is one of the world's five, seven, ten greatest investors alive today, despite his recent track record. He is just an unbelievable investor. i mean no question asked so 
this whole idea of how you think better about investing and how to be productive, how to spend your time well and know what you should not be doing is really what it means to be a good investor. Yeah, next. Yeah, this one. I told thousands of times you shouldn't be overconfident, it gets you into trouble. How many of you drive here? Drive your own car? Wow, there are a lot of rich people here, yeah? That's impressive. Okay. Lots of guys don't drive their own cars. Yeah, that, that, that is part of it. Okay, how many of you think you're above average drivers? Yeah, Jitain Chawla certainly. I mean, no question. I, I, I take that on board. Who else? You guys are such a bloody smart lot. All of you actually think you're above average drivers, but you're not putting your hands up. <laughs> this is called in English gaming the system. <laughs> third, fourth, because I, I'm going to give them second and then third after that. Okay. So, you know, there was an experiment conducted in the United States, not the usual one, where an academic got together and they said, you know, 76% of the guys think they're above average drivers, and by definition, 76% can't be above average. That's fine. There's a much more interesting study. The study was people who had had car accidents and landed up in hospital. So obviously it was a pretty damn serious car accident, right? They had some bad injuries. So a week after they were admitted to the hospital and before they were discharged, you know something? 92% said we are better than average drivers. Can you imagine the nightmare for people who sell motor insurance? And how to underwrite the price of motor insurance? And that has implications for not owning companies which are heavily dependent on motor insurance. Just in case you miss that subtlety. Okay. In India, we value these companies at 50 times earnings, which to me remains one of the miracles of modern investing. Anyhow. The reason people are overconfident, why are they overconfident? It has three, four, it has three, four good reasons. One is, one reason is that being overconfident makes you credible. If someone asks you, you know, why did sort of uh, the market give a 22% return last year? And you say, I don't know, boss. Not clear. Do you think that endears you, gives you credibility in the front of a bunch of 20 other professionals? It doesn't. So one, overconfidence gives you credibility. That credibility allows you preferential access to resources. Once people say that opens the door. Right. And third, once the door is open, your own motivation goes up. Ki boss, dekha? Maine kaise sabko lapet liya? So it's a wonderful and virtuous circle. This overconfidence thing, people are not overconfident for no rhyme or reason. They have a damn good reason to be overconfident. Because it helps them in their lives to get promoted fast to get into the charmed inner circle of their bosses. There are many, many benefits. Can you imagine the guy who says, I don't know, what will be his fate? They'll chuck him out of the investment team. They say, tu yaar, compliance mein ja. Agar tere ko kuch malum nahi hai, tu yaha kya kar rahe? Nikalo us saale ko, bhejo usko. Admin mein bhejo. You don't want that fate, do you? So you got to be overconfident. And therefore, the vast majority of people have subpar investment results. This is a sad, disheartening truth. It's your choice. Whether you want to have better investment results or get ahead in your career. But it's a pretty brutal choice. That's all I want to leave in front of you. There's another one. Oh, I must put this. Oh, I love this one. 
the illusion of explanatory depth. This is very true of all of you. The whole lot here, whether you put up your hands or not, this is true of 100% of the audience sitting here, including Sundaram. Okay? So anyone knows what is the illusion of explanatory depth? Okay, the illusion of explanatory depth is best explained by an example. You have a toaster, a pop-up toaster. You put bread inside it. Put it down. Heat. The bread gets toasted. You have two slices of bread or three slices of bread, whatever. So why does the thing, once you put it down, once you push the toaster ka thing down. Why does it not come up by itself automatically? The right amount of time. Yeah, a toaster is such a simple thing. Yeah. Don't you know how it works? Throw magnet at the bottom of the toaster. The electromagnet attracts the strip that is pulled down. And the ability of the electromagnet to keep that strip down is defined by the strength of the magnet that is used in the toaster. And so a toaster works on the principle of electromagnetic resistance. Bimetallic strip is right, there is one strip. So I have given you all the numbers, right? But it is, everyone thinks a toaster is so bloody simple, yaar. How can I not explain how it works? This is not a rocket. The fact is, all of us are bloody clueless. Most of the time. Close, pretty darn close to 95% of the time. But we just cannot bring ourselves to accept that we are clueless. The day you can accept, like I have now, to a significant extent, my wife is here in the audience as proof. She'll say, this guy knows he's clueless. So I have living proof of the fact that people know that I'm clueless. But it is a huge reason for the overconfidence. Because it's so simple, yeah. How can you not know it? Okay, we'll move on. Stories are more powerful than facts. How, how many of you use the word story every day while you invest? The India story? You all know India story, right? Because this story ke bina aap kuch kar nahi sakte ho. Do you know there's a friend of mine? He's an absolute legend. And the advice he gave to me when I was a broker transformed my life. His name, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. In fact, if Bharat is here in the audience, is Bharat here in the audience? Not yet. Okay. He's a classmate of Bharat's. So, <coughs> his name is Samir Arora. So, when I was a broker in UBS, I had the incredibly difficult task of rolling up to sell ideas to Samir Arora. So, what are So, coffee, pia, kaju, khaya. उसके बाद समीर अरोरा मेरे पीछे लग गए बोले यार बताओ कुछ यार जहां पैसे बन सके मैं बोला यार नोइंग समीर यू आर वेरी हेजिटेंट सो आई स्टार्टेड ऑफ मैं बोला हिंदुस्तान लीवर ये वो आसपास तो समीर वाज काइंड टू मी ही लिसन टू मी फॉर अबाउट 30 सेकंड्स देन यू नो व्हाट ही सेड एनीवन नन ऑफ यू हैव मेट समीर ऑब्वियसली एज ब्रोकर्स ही सेड बॉस नंबर बताओ जी नंबर बताओ I want you people to tell me the number. Number batao ji. Paise number ho se banta hai. Kahani or number. Dono ka mission. Aap log to story de rahe ho. Financialization of saving, je wo, consumption. The truth is that stories are far more powerful than facts. They're compelling. And it depends, jo aap banara se hai na, कौन बनारस से था हाथ ऊपर कीजिए हाँ अरे वाह पाजी आप बनारस आईटीबीएचयू शाबाश ओके तो बनारस में बनारस शहर के बहुत सारे खासियत हैं but one of them is the weavers the weavers of बनारस and I'm sure most of you have heard बनारसी सारी तो वहाँ कहानी अगर आपका जो आपको कहानी बता रहा है ना अगर उसका वीविंग और टेपेस्टी बहुत अच्छा है तो आप वो बात मान जाओगे ये कहानी वाली बात है 
कैसे आप उसको जमाते हो वॉट फ्रिल्स यू गिव वो जो अडॉर्नमेंट है लेस का थोड़ा और वो डिजाइन वो जो पल्लू बोलते ना पल्लू लोग पल्लू में मार खा जाते हैं मैं तो बहुत बार मार खाया हूं ऑल ऑफ यू नो दिस स्टोरी अबाउट स्टीव एंड लैरी ना वन वॉज अ लाइब्रेरी एंड वन वॉज आई मीन यू वन वॉज वेरी हार्ड इंटर ऑल ऑफ यू रेड द बुक्स ऑन बिहेवियरल बिहेवियरल फाइनेंस यू नो द स्टोरी The question is, at the end of the day, you get carried away by the description of the two individuals, but you don't realize that farmers are about twenty times more likely to be present in a population than librarians. But because you say, "Arey, he's an introvert. He likes books. He's highly educated," you say, "Steve is a librarian." Steve is not a librarian. The odds are twenty to one against you. But. the description that you are given of the guy makes you believe so the moral of the story is when you invest focus on history and what history tells you about the base rate it's very important but very difficult because the story is so compelling are sir ji wahan turn around ho raha hai main nandi saab se mila वो सब सही काम कर रहे हैं पूरा का पूरा सही है वहां सर सो वॉट इज द प्राइस टू बुक इज फाइव टाइम ऑलरेडी हु कैज सो वॉट इज द पीस सर अर्निंग आने वाले हैं सर आप इतना भी नहीं समझते हो क्या आप पीई की बात कर रहे हो सर ट्रेलिंग ट्वेल्व मंथ पीई से कोई मतलब ही नहीं है सर अभी तो अर्निंग ट्रिपल होने वाले अगले साल तो पचास सत्रह हो जाएगा फिर तो आप खरीदोगे ना so forget that get real okay now let me give you the best example of <coughs> a wonderful story how many of you have heard of theranos 1 2 3 char bahut sare gyani vidwan yahan baithe hain is kamre mein shabash aapko badhai to theranos was this company where there was a very intelligent woman and like all the dreams that all of you have unfortunately i don't share them She was from Harvard Business School. सबसे ज्यादा हरामी लोग सबसे अच्छे बिजनेस स्कूल से आते हैं उनका बुद्धि सबसे तेज चलता है इसलिए इट नॉट डिफिकल्ट टू फैदम डायरेक्ट कॉज एंड इफेक्ट जितने हरामी उतने बुद्धिमान ठीक है ना तो दिस लेडी हर नेम वॉज जूली नेम इन Holmes, Holmes, Elizabeth Holmes. Her name was Elizabeth Holmes. So Elizabeth Holmes, she spun a fantastic story. She said, "When I was young, I was a little kid. I was very scared to go and give a blood test. And you fall sick, so you need to have blood test. So she said, I have come up with a method by which, with just one prick, almost painless, you can carry out all the tests that you need to." For modern diagnostics, so she started this. So, dunya ke sab venture capital investor wahan pahunch gaye. Koi baaki nahi raha. They were falling over themselves. They said this is revolutionary. On the investors list was Rupert Murdoch, Fox, Larry Ellison, Oracle, all in personal capacity. The Walton family, and the board members were even better. who believed it henry kissinger george shultz american secretary of state jim mattis defense secretary the great the good the powerful the smart were all either on the board or they were investors you know where miss elizabeth holmes is now na no? she's cooling her heels in prison 20 year sentence it was one of the most elaborate frauds carried out in modern corporate history the market cap went to 10 billion before it went to zero and i love this part the cfo was an indian <laughs> there's a lesson in this boss it's a very important lesson very important okay the rest i guess you guys know let's move on next Yep. One of the things all of us are guilty of 
because of this need for cognitive closure that I spoke about, is there are things, there are four, the matrix shows you, four by four. So the accessibility of data and the uncertainty around the assumption risk. So you have unknown knowns, things that you can know but you don't know at the present moment. Then you have things that are known and known. You, it's easy, everyone knows it, the whole world knows it. Then you have known unknowns. In other words, you that you can't know this. And then you have what a famous American defense secretary said, unknown unknowns, Dick Cheney. Okay, now, the idea of turning, when you, when you stop doing very well, you get stuck into looking for information because you think the information can help you to sort things out, to create that pattern, to seek an answer. But the more interesting one is correlation and causation. So very often you identify a pattern. There's high correlation between two things. And you say it is X causes Y, right? X doesn't cause Y. It's very difficult to establish causation because causation has multiple factors, not a single factor. So, I'll give you the best one of correlation and causation. In the mid 80s for seven years, the R square, that is the coefficient of correlation between Bangladeshi butter, produ butter production and the S&P 500 was 0.9. All you had to do was see how much butter Bangladesh made. You would defeat Stanley Druckenmiller because you figured out correlation, correlation and causation. There are other things, regression to the mean, I think you guys know. Whenever a mutual fund begins to seriously underperform, you got to sell it, right? Is that right? Wrong. There is momentum in fund flows. Do you agree with that? No. All right. Actually, the answer is, when mutual funds begin to underperform and money flows out, that's the time to buy those funds. Because there is what is called regression to the mean. Fund performance over long periods of time regresses to an average value. Okay. <clears throat> the law of large numbers. You can have some amazing numbers, some amazing conclusions when you have a sample of four. So if there are four people who are all my friends, they get together and I can at least pick out four in this room and they'll say, Sanjoy is a great investment manager. It's a sample of four. The variation that exists from the actual mean value when you have small samples is incredible in either direction. That is why there's a thing called the law of large numbers. Now I'll tell you this last one and then we'll move on. And anyone Wood's law of miracles and so on can ask me later. So there were the famous Hawthorne experiments in the United States. They went to a factory and they said, why aren't workers more productive? So the first thing they did was they made the lights brighter. Then they measured output. Hmm. Wow. Productivity had gone up. Productivity per worker. Then they said, boss, they deserve more breaks. So they gave them more breaks during the day. Again, productivity shot up. Wonderful, yeah. Then what they did was, they said, no, you need to have shorter but more frequent breaks. That is what really drives productivity. So they did that and again productivity went up. Okay, Then they said, Maybe we should look at what happens when you reverse some of these, but not all of them. So they made the lights dimmer, but kept the brakes. Productivity was marginally inferior. Then they said, not shorter breaks, but longer breaks. Productivity was stable. Then they cut out all this and they went back the second day to the original thing. To what it was before all these productivity shot up. With the dim lights and no brakes, productivity shot up. So, what happened? 
What is the proof of the Hawthorne experiments? What is the message here? I'll explain it to you in a very simple way. I'm watching you, you're watching me, and I'm watching you watch me. And that creates a chain which in your mind makes you think, why are you watching me? And then I realize I'm watching you, and you say, this guy's also watching me. So I, there are many gyanis here. I will cut to the chase. Stock markets are a complex adaptive system. You guys understand this? You know what a complex adaptive system is? The Santa Fe Institute? No, you don't. Okay. So for the first time in my life, I'll have to explain this idea. I'll do it later. Okay. This is another wonderful one. Once you realize that you're getting into trouble and your ideas aren't working out, what do you do? You associate with people who say, yes, yaar. Sarji, aap sahi bol rahe. Especially brokers. Huh? You begin to associate with people who say, you're right, you're right. It's just bad luck, yaar. Bajar nahi chal rahe, aapke stocks nahi chal rahe. That provides you some amount of closure. Then there are people who say the stock market is the economy. So economy nahi chal rahe, toh kya kare? Nothing much you can do, na? The fact of the matter is that the relationship between the stock market and the economy, especially GDP growth, which all of you follow, measured over the last 60, 70 years across 60 countries, R square is less than 0 0.05. So, this 56 inch wala chati. India ka GDP growth sir 7% bajar chalega. Get over it. Just get over that dumb idea. China had 10% plus GDP growth for 15 years. From 1990 to 2005. It was one of the worst performing markets in the world. You've heard of Hyman Minsky? No one's heard of Hyman Minsky. So Hyman Minsky, he and I had a lot in common, except he was far more distinguished and professorial and, you know, became famous. I haven't. But Hyman Minsky had a very good idea. So you can look up Hyman Minsky, Google Hyman Minsky. He had what is called the financial instability hypothesis. He said that, you know, when the economy does well, it achieves stability, companies start have, having rising margins, things are going well, that's the seed of the future instability. Because what does it do? It encourages people to try to grow faster, they take on more leverage, they do things, all of which lead to instability. Right? There's a friend of mine who's in the same class as Hyman Minsky. At least I think so. I've known him for now. 25 years, some of you may even know him. His name is Ayaz Motiwala. I don't know if any of you know him. But Ayaz Motiwala has a very powerful saying which is in line exactly with what Minsky says. He says, Sarje, jitna kharab, utna achha. I hope I've made the point clear. Everyone understood what I'm saying? The best time to invest is when the world is falling apart and you think tomorrow is Armageddon. The truth is that the best times to invest are when the world seems to be about to come to an end. The worst times to invest is when the tailor measures your chest and he runs out of the measuring tape. <laughs> that is fatal. You're just asking for trouble. That's the point of no return. And dare I say it, the last few months have been very interesting in terms of the tailor and the measuring tape. Okay? Experts, why do they get it wrong? Because their mind can't store more than five, six pieces of data. They, and why do they keep on predicting like idiots? The market will be up next year and you know, the EPS will be so and so. When they know that their track record is third rate, they do it because there's a demand for it. That's why experts keep making predictions. So the R square, 
correlation of expert prediction with actual outcomes is 0 0.15, completely immaterial. Predictions have been consistently been too bullish and the worst at turning points. Most interestingly, experts don't learn from their mistakes because predictions don't deal with complex adaptive systems. Systems which can be easily disrupted by things you cannot anticipate. But you ask an orthopedic surgeon after you had multiple fractures and he's conducted the surgery. Ab kya hoga, sarji? He'll say six things. He'll say, do hafte baad aap physiotherapy karoge, hum aapko dono hath mein crutches denge, aap chalna chalu karoge. Uske baad crutches chale jayenge, you need a stick. Uske baad aap thoda further physiotherapy karoge or teen mehne baad you'll be able to do everything. So why is the orthopedic surgeon able to predict? He's seen millions of patients go through the same fracture, right? Like you and I see, we have experience. What do you write on your CV? I have 17 years experience, sir. I can actually say I have about 37. Not that it's worth a damn, but we'll, we'll deal with that on another day. Because the orthopedic surgeon is dealing with your bones. They are not a complex adaptive system. So when you're dealing with a system which is not complex and not adaptive, your ability to predict is very good. So predictions add value. You get a chess grandmaster to walk across and see 40 boards. He can tell you instantly what is the next move, the best move. Because you're not dealing with a complex adaptive system. Yeah, next. <coughs> Data, information, knowledge, wisdom. So on one side, Utility, the other side, availability of information data. So data is just raw fact. When you add context to the raw fact, you say housing starts in Mumbai city were 16.3% higher, higher year on year. <coughs> you put context to the housing start. So that's information. When you apply expertise, exper experience, understanding of previous situations in the same context, that becomes knowledge. What is wisdom? It is judgment. When you apply judgment to knowledge, so I'll give you a simple example. You're given <coughs> data on recessions, you're given data on fiscal policy, you're given data on interest rates. And the chap, the economist, who rolls in from the broker, Ridham Desai or Chetanaya or whoever it is, they come and tell you a bunch of things. Sundaram has experienced this firsthand. He knows all these guys like good friends. So they come in and they give you strategy. Strategy presentation is, Sarji, sunye. Strategy, kya karne ka hai? When Sundaram listens to them, he applies judgment. Because he's been around since 1993, managing institutional money, 30 years. So Sundaram knows in his mind that this time, while a number of the variables and what I'm being told has similarity with the past, it may not work the same way in the future. Because in his head, something rings and says, this is different this time. That's wisdom. The ability to apply judgment to knowledge, which Mr. Chawla said in effect. So I'm more and more proud of knowing him. Okay. This is an interesting one. Far more illustrious, in, uh, an investor far more illustrious than me has used this data repeatedly to make a point. I'm going to make the same point, but also an additional point. Some in the room will even identify that it, legendary investor who has used this slide in the Indian context. So <clears throat> 1 million invested in 1997. 20 years later, what is the ending value? Portfolio value 6.7, 570% absolute. And I think it works out to 9.7% or something. No, 7%, sorry. If you had missed the five best days, and so on. You can read the slide, right? 
So why? You shouldn't be timing the market. That's the moral of the story. Yeah? This is the moral for not doing market timing. Not trying to be wise. Not trying to figure out when to sell and when to buy, more importantly. If you had bought in early 2008 and stayed for the next 10 years, just before the global financial crisis, your results wouldn't have been very much worse than they would have been if you had bought in 2007. Of course, if you had bought in January 2009, you'd have done a little bit better, but not dramatically better. So it doesn't matter actually when you buy, not meaningfully. And the longer the time period, the less the impact. But the point I want to make here is a very interesting point, which not many people think about and which is very dramatic. And I'm not going to get into the mechanics of how you figure this out, but it's worth thinking about as a specific case here and as a more generalized case later. If you had missed the 20 worst days, your return almost doubled. Right? Is there a moral of the story here? All of us spend 90% of our times, of our time, thinking about what to buy. If we spent even 20% of our time thinking about what to sell, I wonder whether our investment results might change a bit. Not because of timing, but because of understanding that this whole wonderful idea Mr. Buffett has presented called buy and hold forever has a sell by date. And I'm sorry <laughs> to sound so rude, but the data and the evidence prove it. So if you had sold Coke in 1998 rather than 2023, what would have been his return in Coke from 1998 to 2023? Any guesses? Sorry? You guys are kind. Yeah, single digit guy, answer is kind. It was actually 3.2%. Okay, so what is the, what is the sum and substance of what I have to say? Come to terms with living with uncertainty. Don't let uncertainty get to you and make you take actions which will <coughs> make the situation worse. When in doubt, do nothing. Most importantly, focus on what you can control. What you own, what you understand well, and what is something that even if it falls, you're happy to live with the consequences of it. You can control taxes and fees. Opt for low fee products. Remember that taxes whittle away your returns. Yeah? You can't control volatility in the market. So there's nothing you can do about it. So stress test your portfolio. If things go bad, what will happen to me? Do I have a margin of safety? Don't stress test on the upside. Stress test on the downside, please. Most of us, we dream in the night. Agar ye share does guna ho gaya, toh toh mein retire kar jaunga. That's also a stress test. It's the wrong kind of stress test. Yeah? Maintain an adequate cushion to ride out the downside. Avoid leverage, minimize churn. Now, <clears throat> Naseem Taleb, another guy, whom I had the good fortune of meeting a couple of times. Like Mahalakshmi met Buffett, I was not quite that lucky, but I met Naseem Taleb. So Naseem Taleb told me something very interesting. He said, Sanjoy, I won't blame you if you can't see the tsunami coming. So I said, it's very unlikely, Naseem, that I can. He said, applies to me as well, in a show of great humility, not usually seen from Naseem Taleb. He <laughs> said, but the sin would be if you hadn't taken precautions in building your portfolio to deal with a tsunami. Do I make myself clear? That is the challenge of portfolio construction. Sad to say this is not what the CFA charter teaches you. 
That is genuine stress testing in practice. The last thing, this is very, very important. Learn to do a personal stress test. <coughs> how do bad results, bad performance, unfortunate things happening, how do they affect you and how do you cope with it? That's really critical to doing well. Investing, especially for institutional investment managers, is about self-belief. If your self-belief is destroyed, you are in deep trouble. Yep, okay, let's move on. Ah, the trend is not your friend. Yep, yep, this is very important and we are at 19 minutes. Okay, so this is, it's hard to spot trends early, primarily because really important trends have exponential growth and you can't see it in the early part of the exponential growth. When something compounds at 17% for the first four years, it doesn't look exponential. The exponentiality is in year 10, year 15, right? And here I have some interesting data for you because I think many of us get stuck into finding the next 100 bagger. So, <coughs> in this business of exponentiality, okay, <coughs> Uber, first ride in Uber, July 5, 2012. When do you think was the billionth ride? First ride in Uber was July 5, 2012. When was the one billionth ride? Three and a half years later. When did Uber make money? Sir, the story is so good, sir. <laughs> what kind of stupid question are you asking us, sir? In fact, the incoming CEO of Uber who replaced the founder, Dara Khushoshai, he said, I don't know when we'll ever make money. So much for trend spotting. Okay. The internet, the mobile phone, these have all been exponential trends. The trick with exponential trends is, it's not necessarily the first guy who makes the money for you. You know, when they set up the locomobile, the automobile in 1906, have you heard of a company called Packard, Stanley Union, Locomobile? Yeah, Ford was there. Oldsmobile, but if you had bought Stanley Union, you'd have been toast by 1920. So it's very difficult, even if you can spot the trend, to buy the right one. Tesla Khariria sir. Tesla. This is the latest trend, EV, EV. A wise man said, no? Sir, I hereby announce the death of the internal combustion engine. A very wise Indian investor. I think if an internal combustion engine had been put in front of him, he wouldn't know that that, that was an internal combustion engine. But he pronounced the death of it. So one, expert prediction. Two, the value of buying EVs. And you got the trend right. EVs are the future. Do you buy Tesla? What do you buy? So many guys. I, BYD? Which Mr. Buffett has bought, by the way. So it's all fascinating stuff. The way to take advantage of trends is Google was the 21st guy to enter the search industry. Not the first, not the Alta Vista, Inc. Tomi, MSN, Yahoo. Google was entrant number 21. Google is now fighting an antitrust case. Okay, so the way to take advantage of trends is you need to have a healthy degree of skepticism and you need to diversify. Trend spotting should not be done with individual stocks. You gotta buy 10 stocks to cut across the trends because you don't know which one is going to succeed. And finally, this is the one place where it might be sensible to use specialty funds. Next. This is the thing about skill and luck. So, <clears throat> the thing about luck is <coughs> that you know, oh, that's fantastic, I've got it on the slide. So if you're a basketball player, you're a chess player, you're a tennis player, chances are your results are more due to skill. Investment goes to this side. <laughs> like the roulette player. So you guys are laughing, that's nice. Because standing in front of you is one of the guys who's incredibly lucky. 
I did something exceptionally dumb in 1995. It changed the course of my life. I put 75% of the value of my family's entire financial assets into one stock. The hallmark of the true idiot. The stock was called Infosys. In 2000 March, at a PE of 110, I refused to sell it because I said, boss, your PE to growth ratio to one. Why do you Subsequently, the value of our investment in Infosys went down 79% in three years. I met Sundaram shortly after that, in June or July 2003, when I had egg on my face in a huge way. So, but by buying that one stock in that ridiculous fashion, absolutely insane fashion, which even a beginner wouldn't do, it changed the course of my life. Am I skillful or lucky? Sorry? My bloody foot. <laughs> there wasn't even one mega ounce of skill in that. But the hand of God was on Messi's head and my head and Maradona's head. That's the point here. And many of you will hate to be called lucky. But if God gave me a choice between being lucky and being smart, 100 days out of 100, I would opt to be lucky. Because in investing, luck is fundamental. The investment universe is massively skewed. Basically, <laughs> the average return is higher than the median return, which means most stocks underperform. Yeah? So I have some good data for you on that as well. So... <coughs> The average return between 1926 to 2016 for the U.S. stock market, 25,000 publicly traded stocks, 14.74%. Median return, 5.23%. Yeah? You know the mean and the average, right? The mean and the median. Okay. <clears throat> More than half of the 25,000 stocks delivered negative return. So much for stock picking. Just five stocks. Apple, GE, IBM, Microsoft, Exxon accounted for 10% of all wealth created during those 90 years. 4% of all stocks, that is 100 stocks out of the 25,000 accounted for all of the wealth created in the 90 years. I hope you guys have figured it out. Now, it is possible if you want to do better than the market, I'm not going to speak about infinite monkey theorem. It's a fascinating thing, but we'll do it another time, God willing, if I ever come back. We'll only speak about the monkeys in investing. But it's a fascinating theorem. You can look it up on Google. <coughs> it is possible to do better than the market. It's not that tough. In fact, the average IQ of Indians is 80. After deep experience and many years of being in the stock market, I have come to the conclusion that the average IQ of people in the stock market is 72. This is based on infinite amount of interactions. So you don't have to be a genius to be in the stock market. In fact, chances are you're in the stock market because you aren't a genius. <laughs> but if you want to do better than the market, you have a damn good chance. One, diversify. Two, you can't beat the market if you are the market. So don't hug the index. And one flaw that you must recognize about indices is they are cap weighted. So, you know, 24% of the American index is accounted for by, where the hell is it? Apple, Tesla, Google, Amazon, Microsoft. So if you buy an index, you're buying a concentrated portfolio. There are 20,000 stocks to invest in, and there are many stocks. The 500, <coughs> the, the, the 500 stock in the S&P 500 in the US has a weightage of 0.04%, but his return may be higher than any of these. I've heard millions of white guys come on TV and call the demise of small caps and mid caps. <coughs> I don't wish to 
spend my time arguing with their superior intellect. All I will say is, from humble acorns do mighty oaks grow. Just remember that much. This is not a plug for small caps, micro caps, mid caps. This is a plug for understanding how nature works, which I think is lost on the incredibly wise guys in the stock market. Yep. It's one thing to create great wealth. So typically entrepreneurs are the guys who are on the list of the Forbes 500. So what is different between them and people who having made a fair amount of money want to preserve it? One, they typically have all their wealth in one company or two or three companies. They take much higher risk and there's a high element of their active personal involvement in the businesses that they set up. Clearly, they're very lucky to survive because they have many, many competitors and they could have got wiped out. When you want to preserve great wealth, what you need to do is about exactly opposite. You need to diversify. You need to cut down the level of risk you take. Your involvement with what you own is very far away. It's very passive. You can't tell the guy in Cummins, India, brother, this is the way you should run your company. Actually, some fund managers do. They go meet the CEO and say, Sarji, aapko aisa karna chahiye. And I remember one legendary Indian CEO who told another legendary Indian CIO, Sir, when I ask for, when I need your advice, I'll ask for it. You may leave now. <laughs> Luck, the important thing in preserving wealth is the need to be disciplined. You shouldn't stray from what works for you. Okay, are we done or is there something more? Uh, yo, yeah, there is one more. Come on, let's get on with that. Next slide. This is the end in more ways than one. So I've spoken about this. Basically, we have a lot of very bad instincts. We are greedy. That's the best. That's a universal trait. If there's a guy in this room who isn't greedy, put up your hand. So put up your hand. I want to meet this guy and touch his feet. Thank God we're honest. Honesty is also useful. Integrity is important. We are all greedy. We are all bloody scared of losing the money that we make. So there is massive fear. Now my recommendation may sound a bit like <coughs> Gautam Buddha on investing. Right? You can decide to override your emotions and control your baser instincts. Impatience, fear, greed, lack of discipline. So one, this I used to say when I was in HDFC. And people recognized what a clown I was then. I said, if we want to have outstanding results in the investment team, we should all go and see a matinee show in the afternoon. Sundaram should remember this. Everyone thought I was stark reading mad. Sarji, what are you doing? Meeting? Meeting? We have a meeting? Achha. Baki, sir. Sir, we have to meet with the company visit. How do you keep yourself occupied? How do you give yourself a sense of importance? By being busy. By overtrading. Overtrading leads to <laughs> bad results. You know, I'll give you this. I recently put money into a fund run by a woman. Men are more overconfident than women. They overtrade more. And their results are worse. So, women in favor of men. But you know who are the best investors? You're absolutely goddamn right. The dead are the best investors. Because when the portfolios of the dead go to court for probate and it takes three, four years, and the portfolio comes back after three, four years, those portfolios outperform the portfolios of any goddamn thing which has been traded for those four years by a massive margin. As they say in Delhi, Jai Mataji. Power to the dead. Okay. Prefer simplicity over complexity. This is really asking for the moon. Avoid derivatives, avoid options, avoid ports, avoid calls, <coughs> avoid complex ETFs. Keep your fees low. Don't churn. And as I said, it's very difficult. You, you know, you guys wouldn't have jobs if you just sat at a table and stared out of the window. But that's the winning formula in investing. Buy a couple of ETFs. 
one liquid fund to cope with the, what Nassim Taleb called the coming tsunami, do nothing else. You'll do wonderfully well. When I write my will, I'm going to mandate that whatever little money I made and is inherited should be invested in that fashion. <coughs> Create an investment policy statement. So this is about three simple ideas. A statement of your objectives and goals. And therefore, what your asset allocation should be. And <coughs> rebalancing those assets. With a clearly defined formula. At the end of every year, rebalance once a year, rebalance every six months. So that the asset allocation remains in place. It's very easy to do. It hurts your ego. But it's the dumb way of coming out ahead. We've spoken about building a margin of safety. This one is... Everyone is focused. Sir, you what I'm an investor. Right? Is there anyone in this room who is not an investor? All are investors, no? I'm a speculator. I'm going to do this every two, three, three, four, 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 four. I buy eight stocks a year. I look at my portfolio once a day. Am I focused on the long term? So all of you know your net worth. Huh? I hope all of you know your net worth. Focus on the long term. Don't look at your portfolio more than once in three months. And destroy Excel. Find better software. It's, it's, all of you are laughing. You cannot imagine the consequences. See, once you focus on five years out, three years out, you don't need to forecast, you don't need to have expert predictions, you don't need to churn, you don't need to do a shit. That's what encourages good behavior. You get it? Is the chain coming into play? Good. Gurcharan Das would be happy. He owned Infosys for 14 years. Look at your portfolio once a year. Have a play account. This helps in being good. If you have managed your subbola, then keep 10% of your portfolio and what you have to do is to do it. You have to do it. You have to do it. All the things that give you the adrenaline rush. You know, sir, I have to do it. I have to turn around. I have to do it. 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 Put 10% of your money to keep yourself psychologically <coughs> distracted. <laughs> Write that off. But keep it. It's very important. Lastly, and this is very interesting. Find an advisor who doesn't tell you the best stocks to own, who doesn't tell you, you know, what should be the right strategy for every market. Find an advisor. This is very important. Some of you are wealth managers, some of you are advisor who tells you how to be disciplined who helps you in that journey of being disciplined that's the role of the advisor not picking tomorrow's hot stock thank you don't think i have much more to say uh, obviously that was a great uh, session and i took some copious well, one notes. more thing to say sorry i'll be very brief in this Listen to this presentation, have a good laugh, enjoy yourself, be amused, but continue to do what you've done so far in your life. <laughs> because that is what works for you. That's how you got as far as you got. So just dismiss Sanjay Bhattacharya from your presence the minute this session is over. Just continue doing exactly what the bloody hell you have always done. Okay. So, uh, Sanjay, in the very first slide, uh, I don't know why you said that, you know, Mahalakshmi is going to, you know, laugh at this first slide when you were talking about behavioral um, biases. Um, <clears throat> I did an interview with uh, Daniel Kahneman some time ago, which is yet to be published on money control. This is called self-selection bias, Mahalakshmi. <laughs> <laughs> in psychology, that's what they call it. So, I mean, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, slightly embarrassed to say this because one of my favorite quotes from um, uh, Kahneman is the idea that the future is unpredictable is undermined every day by the ease with which we 
uh, they explain the past. Correct. And as a media person, uh, to be reporting on stocks every That's day and looking at That's what keeps you your daily job and your daily lunch. You get your lunch. Job, so I yeah. can't really say this, but Correct. I think the only small change that we have made in money control is that now we don't distinguish between causation and uh, you know correlation. So yeah. say the stock has gone up six percent. The company got. Uh, announced that it got an order of uh, 2,000 crores. So we don't say this. Yeah, your part is actually the better part. Oh. Okay, so the question is this. So uh, the future is unpredictable. <clears throat> My understanding of value investing is like over the years is that it relies a lot on history. Mm -hmm. The idea of moat, mm -hmm. the idea of how a business, how strong a business is, the idea of management integrity, track record. Even the idea of reversion to mean, all of these have a very strong element of history. While investing is truly about the future. Now, how do we reconcile these two? When you actually look at something, and today, you know, uh, the cognitive way the markets closure, today Malakshmi? are. You're seeking cognitive closure? Yeah. By trying to reconcile the two? Don't. But how do you think about you it? Use, Tell me how you you use the all these of what has happened in the past to learn about what you find yourself looking at, to inform, to have better judgment, to bring wisdom into play. But it doesn't mean that the future will be like the past. So suppose I have a terrific understanding of, let us say, the horse whip and buggy industry. Hmm. Because I specialized in that. In my time, you know, when I started my life, people used to study buggies and horse whips. But that's not of much use in the year 2024. It is of use in understanding how buggies and horse whips got disrupted by the car. And how now you'll have autonomous cars and driverless cars. So that's the important part. But it's not the expertise around Okay, let me give you a simple example, and I don't mean to pull anyone down. One of the businesses which had fantastic moats were local newspapers yeah. in a city because yeah. they had guaranteed advertising revenue, they had readership, they had, and then the internet happened. What happened to the Washington Post? So, one of some of the greatest guys in the world, this is not to say they don't understand what is going on, that, you know, it won't uh, be something that has incredible value to the people who still read newspapers. And there are a fair few number. But the question is, is it a good investment? Is a function of where you're headed with regard to what that, which audience that thing caters to. And that is truly unknown. You don't know the future. You don't know what the internet can do. You don't know what AI can do, for instance, going forward. So this moat idea, it also rhymes in my head with the goat idea. Because moats and goats now are two of the most powerful thoughts that embrace all our minds. Yeah. Federer is a goat. Nadal, goat. Djokovic, goat. All goats. They're running in the mountaintops, up and down like the moats. These are complex thoughts and they are multivariable. And I don't think our minds, as human minds, unless you're a Buffett or a Manja, with an IQ of 180, we don't have IQs of 180. That's the first thing we've got to come to terms with. All of us can't be the next Warren Buffett. All of us can't be the next Seth Klarman or the next Charlie Manja. I made the point, prefer simplicity over complexity by simple, easy to understand businesses. So Sundaram and I, again, I'm delighted to say I'm with him in this. We both own ITC for bloody donkey's years. Because we know individuals will continue smoking. Cigarettes are not about to be replaced. We know no amount of health consciousness advertising going to destroy that. We also know that when both of us bought it, it was dirt cheap and it could have got cheaper. And we were both ready to face that consequence. Booze. You're not going to have AI for booze. <laughs> it's a really hardy business. 
So my point is, you know, keep it really simple. Forget all this jazz and all this complex algebra and buy what is sustainable, what generates cash flow, what is, in the case of ITC, though both he and I would be a bit embarrassed, but run by people whom you can trust. I recently became a father-in-law, so I have the father-in-law test in front of me. Would you get your daughter married to the guy who runs ITC? Would you? That's the Buffett test. <laughs> and that's where I fall short in ITC. <laughs> That's exactly. But Sanjeev Puri is a very nice guy. He and I are best friends. I, I, I agree, but the point is that you know, even in ITC, I mean, now nobody talks about it. That you know, the the ESOPs that they gave out and the kind of yogi trades Divesha. that That was India. Yogi Deveshwar, not Sanjeev Puri. So, but that was, I mean, the culture of these organizations continues. This change, dire dire badalne ki koshish kar raha. That was Yogi Deveshwar, K L Chog, Yogi Deveshwar. I worked for ITC also in an earlier avatar. So, but yeah, you're so right. But the, the they're, they're, for example, in today's context, and I'm asking this because this is really in the news, like pretty much like ITC was five, seven years ago, Delta Corp. You know, you know this casino business will go on for a long time. Uh, right now, it is, it, it's bad news because they have some bizarre kind of, uh, you know, yeah, tax, tax thing. Correct. Mm. And I saw Ashish Kocholia dump the stock on day one. Mukul Agarwal is sitting on it. You know the stock is going to be down 20, 30% on the same day because it's some bizarre thing. How do you take a call on, you know, you don't. this is classic value see, investing. They say that you, see, you proved me right. on the street. No calls. You don't take calls. You don't want to be a Vodafone idea. No towers, no but calls. You, you get to know it's Vodafone. This is hindsight bias. See, no, it's not. It's, it's like, I don't understand this business well. I won't touch it. To the guys who understand it well, what they choose to do is their prerogative. And actually, if you ask me, I mean, this is absolute blind tukka because I don't understand gambling very well. Though I love gambling. I mean, given half a chance, I'll be out to gamble. My wife, we went to London on our first holiday to London, and I told my wife in the evening, we were just recently married, two years, and I said, I'm going out to lose some money at bridge. And sure enough, I lost the money, but I had a great time when I came back, and I told her, you know, we're 50 pounds cheaper. In 1988, you know, a lot of money, 50 pounds, for someone as broke as me. And this is the great thing about my wife. She said, it doesn't matter. Whenever you want to go next, just tell me. <laughs> That's why our marriage has survived for as long as it has. <laughs> It's all credit to her. But if I were to bet on gambling stocks, I would bet on digital gambling as an enterprise. I think the future of gambling is more and more online. And this is not to say that, you know, wind resorts will fold up or Las Vegas will fold up. But can we see a Washington Post here? Maybe. I don't know this business. I, I don't want to make forecasts. So that is a bet on the future, isn't it? When you but say that, I don't make that bet because I don't understand this future very well. I understand Britannia. I think people be eating plum cake for a long time. I mean, I'll be eating plum cake for as long as I'm alive. It's a small sample. Maybe my theory is wrong. But people be having biscuits, they'll be having cakes, they'll be having bread. I like Britannia. I mean, if the valuation were more reasonable, so that I'd is, buy it. that is the next question. That when you sort of have these companies with established uh, presence or brands or uh, where the product or segments you're fairly sure that you know toothpaste is going to be there around for quite some time or sanitary pads or whatever mm. so those are great businesses but now that story has been told even a lot of it a lot of people who meet know that story and that is why the moment PNG you catch a stock 000. like that is yeah, it's 18,000 correct so uh, so therefore, they don't, you know, for a value investor, don't make the cutoff in terms of valuations or creating right. that margin of safety. So the only right. way you can buy those is when there is negative news around the stock. So how do you navigate this? Because anything that is unproven. You have to have, this is what this guy said, Mike Steinart said. Where is maximum money made? Maximum pessimism. No. Variant perception. Where you, after doing a whole lot of homework and putting in a whole lot of effort, have a set of beliefs that is different than that of the crowd. And it doesn't happen very often. And when it does happen, bet big on it. ITC. 
I mean, I remember when the two of us brought ITC, I the world was ready to strangle us, yeah. We were the butt of jokes, Sundaram. Every guy whom we met said, Are, Sanjoy certainly was Satya Chukai. Sundaram they are more kind to because they know he's smarter. They don't make the, as much fun of him. But, I mean, because my, sorry? Well, <laughs> but, but the point is this, simply, that that was the point of variant perception in ITC. People believed that ITC was going down the chute because FMCG was not making money, food was not making money, return on capital employed was poor, they had some cash guzzling businesses, they had paper, they had hotels. And the government was... And, the, and there's this perpetual story about ITC, you know, it's a wonderful story, but base rate doesn't support this. Excise bana denge. So cigarette business will dub jayega. In fact, if there's one business in this country which has genuine pricing power, genuine, it's ITC. Because they can raise prices as soon as excise rates go up and the impact on volumes is limited and reverts very quickly back to normal. So when you talk of modes, unless you're ESG type, and you know, many people I've heard, this is another famous phrase that people throw at me all the time, pricing power, Sanjoy, damn good. Pricing power must be manifested in consumer behavior, hmm. in purchasing. So I think it's a good question, Mahalakshmi. The question is, you must buy when you are different from what the rest of the world believes. And that creates a cheaper valuation, incidentally. Where there is variant perception, typically valuation went back in the morning and so, they are here to stay. More importantly, the know-how and the capability that eClerks has built, let's say Lehman has gone bust 60% of its revenues coming, someone will buy it over. Right. So I bought eClerks and I'm delighted to say 15 years later I continue to own it. And it, I didn't know at that time they would go up 75 times for me. So you can never, this is one thing I'd like to leave with the audience. Please stop hunting for multi-baggers. Please, please get this God-forsaken idea out of your heads. Just behave like normal human beings. This is a virus, it's going to kill you. This quest for multi-baggers destroys your judgment in your head. You become overconfident. You become greedy, you become, you have a willingness to cover the faults of the company that you're buying. You want to wipe them all away. Every business has weaknesses. So how do you think about stocks when you buy? So, so is there any uh, thought Sustainability. around what should be the return potential in a stock? No, 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 no return potential. Will this business be in existence 10 years from now is my first question. Is this a business that, because otherwise what's the point? The power of compounding is not going to work in your favor. Why are you worried about returns? Only things that survive, Darwin, will flourish. So first rule of good investing, buy businesses that are going to be there for the long haul. Biscuit, I come back to it, cigarettes. That have survived. You know, it's the most profitable stock in terms of returns in the world from 1900 till 2023. Congratulations, Mahalakshmi. You and I are on the same page. Philip Morris is the right answer. Kaun banega karodpati? Kash, kash, asa hota hai. Ho jayega, ho jayega. But but the question is the platforms. The most important guy on the platform is the guy who sells the ticket. वो जो टिकट बेचता है ना तो प्लेटफॉर्म के अंदर जाने के लिए उसका शेयर खरीदो आप, because that guy has cash flow. But the platforms have no goddamn cash flow and they're talking about unit economics all the time. तुम्हारा यूनिट इकोनॉमिक्स इतना अच्छा है तो पैसे कैसे नहीं बन रहे? DoorDash, Zomato, Swiggy. So good you brought this point because I have seen a lot of value investors as we think of them as value investors. New age have value bought, investors. Have bought into, even old age value investors have bought into Zomato. 
बहुत सारे लोग बोलते हैं कि बस जोमैटो एट 35000 करोड़ ऑफ मार्केट कैप वाज अ ग्रेट वैल्यू बहुत सस्ता है बिकॉज़ ही डजंट अर्न 1 करोड़ यूनिट इकोनॉमिक्स पे फोकस करो जी क्लाइनर परकिंस है हम सब क्लाइनर परकिंस सेकोया हम सब उनके बाप है वी आर सीइंग द फ्यूचर ना एट नो प्राइस शुड एज अ वैल्यू ट्रू वैल्यू इन्वेस्टर एट नो प्राइस आर दीस टू बी टच नो दे आर If they earn something like now, I'm not able to distinguish between jokes and no. Uh, I'm dead serious. serious. I'm dead serious. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I'll tell you the day, the first two quarters, the first two quarters that Zomato makes 500 crores a quarter or shows signs of making 500 crores a quarter and stop, stop saying that we are EBITDA positive. The day the CEO of Zomato stops talking rubbish like that, we are EBITDA positive. that day i will look at zomato very carefully so clean fat the mindset must change the aim of buying stocks is not to change the world the aim of buying stocks is to make money i might sound like a guy from the 1940s and in fact my role model and in my whole life is driven by a guy called benjamin graham and walter schloss these are my two ultimate role models in investing but if you if a business can make money i'm not interested in stories stories are compelling base rate ignorance of the base rate is huge in new age companies hmm. when look at the failure of startups yaar mai are sir ye to monopoly hai india mein sirf do hi hai na swiggy aur zomato hum to sab khayenge more women entering the workforce more meals ordered in the guy had the audacity to come on tv and say that so far the market is massively under penetrated because people are not ordering for breakfast and for tea <laughs> what an opportunity and people are only ordering twice a week can you imagine i mean i fell off my chair when i heard that <laughs> this is the next multiplier and actually as it be truth be told samir bought this at i think 55 and he's done bloody well on it because 105 so the question is everyone doesn't have to have the same mindset to investing no, that i do it's really a question of mindset a lot of people i thought like for example nilesh surana has bought. many I smart mean, many, guys many have people many. who uh, one would think will not overpay are very conscious of cash have it, it, bought these my lakshmi so. what works for me may not work for millions of people it's about knowing yourself because the way i behave is a function of who i am I am not someone else. If I can't live with what I am not, right? So if I can't figure so it out, so first thing, so the takeaway from that is all all investors have to first figure out what goes with your money. What can you deal with? Right. So fair enough. Because if it turns bad, you have to deal with the consequences. That is the difficult part. Market yeah. timing. it's damn tough to be right once to buy the multi bagger but even tougher to know when to sell yeah so you got to be right twice sure. sorry yeah so um, so uh, coming back to the behavioral biases uh, yeah how do you get get past these because i asked this to daniel kahneman also do you think fast or slow he said like all people i also think fast <laughs> Uh, and it is not efficient to think slow correct absolutely so, right uh, so how do we avoid these and what kind of partnerships i mean a lot of people talk about partnerships right like even buffet they say that great partner sounding board and that is how you sort of uh, get clarity uh, on your ideas so partners i mean give me your experience uh, mm. i know you are friends with uh, ramdev but is that mm. he is he a sound chirag settlewood ye sundaram these are the guys so i really trust i ring them all up so is so so are these like minded people or should you have no, no, you know no, no, people no, 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 who no, 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 challenge no, no. it's not like minded it is if they think i've got it wrong that's why i really like these guys they'll tell me in a very nice polite way Sanjay, think of it in another way. That is the value of that friendship. That I want people to tell me I'm wrong. I don't want people to tell me I'm right. I want dissent. 
Your best friends are those who have the guts to tell you to your face that you got it wrong. And you and uh, uh, Sundaram have similar philosophy in general. He's much more evolved than I am. His let's, portfolio let's PE will be. Sundaram, what's your portfolio PE? 23? 24? Mine is 16. So, yeah, it's, okay, so we think similar. Mein hona chahiye, you will have but we think system. broadly similar. That's right. We have the same basic ideas in our head. We are very uh, aware of the need not to overpay, to own high quality businesses that will be around for the long term, that generate cash flow on a predictable basis, that have a reasonably dominant position in the businesses in which they compete. So, all that. But to answer the Kahneman question, to come back to what you said, so how do you figure out how to behave? And obviously, I mean, the one thing he said is absolutely right. You build, you know, intellectual partnerships. I have one other answer to that, which works for me, may not work for everyone. I'm a great believer in intuition and the ability to educate intuition. In other words, many of us in our heads, we get the belief that you can achieve. Because, you know, you have a fireman, a firefighting squad, they go, the building is just coming down, it's blazes. They enter the building because they want to rescue people. But the fireman knows when to get out. And you know what's the signal for that in their heads? When the flame turns from orange to blue, it right. just gets the hell out of there. I have some of those over the years. I have an intuitive sense of what works. And my belief is <clears throat> that you can work on making your intuition get better and better and better. And that is a complement to this thinking slow part. Because the stock market doesn't give you time. Sometimes, not all the time to think slow. So, if you can educate your intuition, there's some fantastic guys in that area. There's a guy called Jerd Jigerenzer. There's a guy called Robin Dawes. There's a guy called Hasty. You know, all these guys have done seminal work in the area of intuition. And for guys who are seriously interested, I think they should look at their work. But is that not also a result of experience? Like at least Kahneman says that it is about the feedback loop. Like Correct. An anesthetist will have greater Absolute. intuition than uh, an oncologist. Correct. Absolutely right. So the question is, how do you refine that? Can we, first of all, the first thing is not to ridicule intuition. Many people in their minds, they ridicule intuition. So the first hurdle is to say no, it's not something to be ridiculed. The second thing is, to say that how do I make this more reliable as a way of making good decisions? What are the things that I need to build into it? Can I hunt for data to support my intuition? Can I, can I, a bunch of things can I do? Can I look at, you know, when I had this kind of hunch, past events, when they were in my head, what were the outcomes? What led to good outcomes and bad outcomes? So you're not just using intuition blind. You're using intuition supported by a framework of decision making that is objective. And it does work. Sure. We're going to be booted out by Jiten soon. He's going so, to throw us out. Yeah, there is this question from okay. somebody in the audience. Yeah, sure, Can sure. Can you comment on the bias towards quality stocks without a sense of valuation and price? It's called uh, career fixation. You have to, your career is more, you'll never get thrown out for owning Good Infosys or TCS or, you know, whatever. The board of trustees and the board of directors of an AMC will never throw out a guy who owns these companies. Will they? But if they saw what I own, they'd say, Saleh ko jail mein bharti karo. Luckily, it's my money. I'm not answerable to anyone. The obsession with buying quality at any price is, that it's going to destroy you. Because in a funny way, you've assumed the best. There's no upside left for you. But in case something does go wrong, 
the whole world will penalize those companies incredibly severely. So this, this quality, and what is quality? I mean, I've read academic papers on this. Quality is not the opinion of 10 of your friends. It is capital efficiency. It is, I've seen many companies being called quality run by chaps who should be in prison, yeah? They're not quality stocks. I, I've seen businesses which, and I don't want to name this one, it's in the index. It's a huge company. There was a period of 20 years when it didn't generate free cash flow. And even now, it generates piddly amounts of free cash flow. How can that be quality? Growth is not the only determinant of quality. In fact, sometimes slowing growth will have a miraculous effect on free cash flow. If you had 100% of a company, Mahalakshmi, Suppose you own 100% of the corner side pan shop. Would you want to go up, leave the shop in the afternoon, go back to the local money lender, the pawn shop, and say, I need to borrow from you to keep my shop going? Would you? No. So when you're an investor, why do you allow that mindset to thrive? The local panwala, he comes, money in the cash box in the morning, money in the cash box in the evening, cash box evening greater than cash box morning. Is that not a sensible mindset? It is. I think the, the question that people struggle with today is that free cash flow companies are very expensive. No. I can name, I won't do it here. I can privately give you 15 which aren't. Okay. And I own all 15. So therefore, so therefore now the other way people say is that, you know, India, ye bhi story hi hai, that India is a growing economy, cash flow. <laughs> Uh, should you be really fixated about free cash flows? No, no. Why quality, quality. Just, be just, focused just... on quality till you get destroyed. Then you'll come to free cash flow later. See, this is... No, no, I'm telling I mean, the truth. I, I, this I, is my I, belief. This is my core belief. People may think that you're actually No, no, say. because I really believe this. The guys who buy quality at any price till they are destroyed, people are not going to get this idea out of their head. This is like what happened in the tech boom. It took people two years to figure that out. 2001, 2002. You know, banks are the most dangerous thing you can own. You know why? It's just a bloody pyramid of leverage. Hmm. But in 2008, only people discovered it. Abhi bhi log bank kharitte ja rahe at absurd prices. Hey sir, HDFC bank is the greatest underperformer. Kya hua? Kya hua? Quality kharit ke. Wo to ultimate quality hai na? If you have, tell me because I want to own that one then. Look at where HDFC Bank is. I wish life were unidimensional, single variate. There are many things that make a stock perform, that make for successful investing. It's not one variable to simplify, to oversimplify, to cut to the chase and say, if I buy quality, I will be successful, it's dumb. There are two huge banks in India. Both have had a major transition in leadership. Leadership counts for a hell of a lot in a bank. You have nothing else. You have no fixed assets. You don't have suppliers. So how do you, uh, again coming back to basics, how do you think about this? Because a few minutes back you said that the first question you need to ask is, the longevity of the business. Yes. You have that in Yes, HDFC. very much. So, uh, 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 is it that at various different points in time, different factors yes. will be the driving force the importance for the stock of different and different variables will change will over time. Changed. So, Absolutely. you have to keep questioning and reviewing what are the key factors that will drive performance over what time period? And that really, Mahalakshmi, for the guys... Because why are you not applying the same logic that you applied for ITC in HDFC? That you can own HDFC because and you can Because an idiot can run a really great business and an idiot has. Remember the famous Buffett saying? If you but have a truly great business... That the business banking is not a truly great business. I don't think banking is a truly great business. I think banking is an incredibly dangerous and volatile business which is dependent on an external environment and a global environment. And now we're being booted out. 
So, so yeah, but you're right that at different times, different things matter. Yeah. And, and, and the, to put that further, one step further, the chap who really has an expert understanding of a business is the guy who knows which factors to apply when, and he understands the consequences of all the factors. Sure. Mahalakshmi, I must thank you no, no, a hell of a lot, and all of you, <laughs> yeah. for putting up with my antics.